We started preaching on the life of Gideon, a character study. The man called Gideon. The famous story in the Bible of Gideon's 300 that defeated uh, the army of the Midianites. And they never even fought. They had pitchers in their hand, had lamps in there. And when the cry went out, they all broke the lamps and the lamp shined forward. And they proclaimed the sword of the Lord in the Gideon. The Midianites thought that for each lamp, there must have been thousands of people there. And they had been surrounded. So they all fled. And uh, there's several stories in the Bible about how the Israelites fought a battle, never, never fought. God is the one who fight. I learned a long time ago, God's better at fighting my battles than I am. And so, last Sunday, uh, maybe you saw a little bit of Gideon in yourself, or a little bit of you and Gideon. Not sure of things, understanding that God did not make you strong. God did not make you the smartest person in the world. He didn't make you the strongest person in the world. He didn't make you the most righteous person in the world. He gave you a body of Midianites to fight off. Enemies from within sometimes are worse than enemies without. Can I hear you say amen? And so maybe you saw a little bit of Gideon in you. But let's, let's pick it back up again this morning. And again, I'm just going to kind of go through Scripture and uh, just lay out some things for you this morning. There was, as I was, as I was going over this several years ago, there was part of this story that just absolutely floored me when I understood what it was all about. And uh, that's what I'm going to try to convey to you this morning. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Of Judges chapter 6. And uh, again, this sermon we're just going to kind of go until time's running out on us. And then we'll leave it up there and pick it up again next week. Judges chapter 6 verse 11. Are you there? Say amen. There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah. That pertained unto Joash the Abiezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That's what we touched on last week. God has already given him the title of a mighty man of valor, but he does not see himself that way. And so Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Where be all of his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us, and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith... Shall I save Israel? Behold, and I want you, here's what I'm going to concentrate on for a little while this morning. Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask God for wisdom and for understanding this morning as we go through his word. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for these people that are gathered here in this place and those, Lord, that are gathered with us online. And Lord, I pray that wherever they are, wherever they are, as they're listening to this, maybe live or maybe recorded later, Father, that you would speak to them, you would deal with them, you would give them encouragement, you'd give them help, that you'd give them grace. Father, each one of us, when we came to you, we came to you bankrupt. We had written checks in our flesh that our flesh could no longer cash. We have done way too many things against your commandments. 
And Father, we came to you with absolutely nothing with which to present to you except for brokenness, ruin, hunger, thirst, being destitute, being naked in your sight. That's how we came to you, God. We had nothing in our hands to bring. And yet, Father, you loved us and you set your love upon us and you accepted us. And Father, though we be poor, you have made us rich by your mercy and by your grace. Help us to understand, God, that it is not the one who does the most that pleases you. It is the one who leans on you the most and is broken before you the most. The ones, Father, as you told the woman in the Bible, because we have been forgiven much, we love much. And Father, we ask you, God, Lord, to just deal with our hearts and show us, Lord, where we are and who we are. And Father, that you set your love upon us simply because you love us. And Father, we may not truly understand that in this lifetime, but give us a little bit of wisdom today and help us, dear God, to accept it. We ask this thing in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. For years... In my life, I struggled with acceptance. Wanting to be accepted when I was in school. I wanted to be accepted by some of the people around me. I wanted to be accepted by a certain crowd. I didn't have much physically to offer. I wasn't the, the big sportsman on campus. Wasn't the smartest one in school. So I thought, well, if I can't run fast and I can't, spell better than everybody I guess I'll try being funny so I learned to try to make people laugh sometimes that paid off sometimes that didn't but I wanted to be accepted by people I wanted to be in with them when I got into college I found myself being the same way I wanted to be uh, I wanted people to like me I wanted to be accepted by them and, and I struggled with that the first year of college the second year uh, was a lot easier and a lot better. Uh, I was the student body chaplain. And a lot of times the kids would come to me, the young people would come to me and, and they just talk things out. They knew that I was going to listen to them and maybe I had something to offer. Then several years later, I wanted to be accepted by the denomination. I wanted the, the higher ups in the state level of denomination, the national level. I wanted them to know my name. I wanted them to accept me. I wanted them to, to think that I was really something, that I could provide something for them and do something for them. And maybe I could work my way up in the denomination. God, every time I did that, God always sent that crashing back down. God did not want me accepted by certain groups of people because he knew that at some point I would have to say things against those very people. And if I was in with them, I wouldn't say it. God knew me. I wanted that acceptance. I wanted that. But every time I, I would reach for that, I would find myself not being up on their, on whoever there was. I wasn't on their level. And that really, that really bothered me. Until I realized that being accepted with man is not my calling. Being accepted by God is. That's your calling. That's who you're supposed to be reaching for. Everybody's like me in some way. You had a group of people that you wanted to impress. You had a group of friends that you wanted to feel like you were part of that with them, whether they were doing good or whether they were doing bad. Some of us boys always knew where the bad guys were and we would jump in with them. Whatever they were doing, that's what we would jump in and do it with them. Whether they was doing nice things or doing evil things, that's what we, but we wanted that acceptance. Gang membership is growing huge in our communities. 
young people wanting to be accepted by the, by the men with power in their community, they want that acceptance and they will do extreme things to get it, including crimes against other people. Shooting people just because the gang said, if you want to be in it with us, you got to shoot that person. And they'll do it. White, black, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. There's always a gang to follow. The Bible says that we're not to follow a multitude to do evil. And that's what a lot of times we find ourselves doing. So here's Gideon. Gideon's all alone. He's threshing wheat in private. Doesn't want to get caught by the Midianites. His family is poor. Meaning that his family has no influence in the things that go on in town. You, always, you know that in every town there's always the in crowd in town. They're, they're the ones who sit on the city council, the school board. They're the mayors. They're on the fire department. They're on this. There's always that in crowd in every town. There's one of those in Festus, one in Crystal City. There's one of those everywhere. And I'm just not the type of person that I like being in that kind of in crowd. That just, because sometimes the things they do, I just don't go along with and can't go along with. When I saw things going on in denomination that I, I knew was not right, it was a struggle with me. To, I wanted to be a part of that, but I knew it wasn't right. And there was just this inward fight within me about what to do about it. And God said, well, I'll make that easy. And what he did was he had some of the guys that I really looked up to hurt my feelings so bad that I want, wanted nothing to do with them ever again. I walked away with a pooch lip out going, they hurt my feelings. So I said, well, I'll never, be, I'll never be with them again. And God's going, that's exactly where I wanted you. But Gideon's family is poor. They have nothing. They don't have status. They live on the other side of the tracks. He's not accepted in any crowd. He's just out there by himself. And he doesn't think much of himself. He doesn't think he's anything. And he's the least in his father's house. And the Lord said, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Now there where he says, My family is poor in Manasseh. I want you to take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. God showed me something looking into this. I never saw it before. It's been there all this time. I never realized it. Never occurred to me that it was this way. And yet it is. If I... I just want to... I want to throw something at you. It's not a trick question. Just trying to get us to be honest a little bit. If I said... Today to you that in my pocket I had the winning super whopping Powerball mojo lottery ticket worth $235 million. If I said that I had that and I was just looking for somebody in the church to give it away to, who would take it? Thank you for, uh, my daughters, first one to raise their hand. Thank you for being honest. Who else? There you go. Raise your hand. $235 million, free money. I mean, you're not stupid, right? Money's free money's free money. I don't happen to have it. Sorry to let you down. I went through this stage when Lisa and I was young and married. I didn't like getting up, going to work every day. And I went through this stage where I thought if I just win the lottery, I wouldn't have to do this. And I bought a few lottery tickets. Lost a dollar every time. Sometimes I'd go, that was the number I was going to pick. Why didn't I pick it? God knew me. God knew that it wasn't wise for me to have all that money. So he just kept us a little bit poor and hurting sometimes where we had to pay bills with prayer. You ever done that? Paid bills with prayer. Well, that's kind of the way God wants it. And I was looking through these. We call these the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. We call these the Beatitudes. And I never really saw this before until I started looking at it in this context. Why did God choose Gideon? Why did God choose this man? Why didn't God get some of those town guys or some of those elders of Israel? Why didn't God pick the politicians? Why didn't he pick the, one of the famous people there? 
amongst the Israelites. Why did he go to the lowest man and the lowest family that there was? Why did he choose that? God, listen to me, God chooses the poor over the rich. And he does it every single time. I want you to look at this list of who God blesses. And if you'll notice, every one of them is a weakness or they are poor or they are downtrodden or they are hurting or they're not much as far as the world is concerned. These are the ones that God sends the blessing to. Blessing in the Bible is always a salvation word. If you are blessed, you are saved. If you're cursed, you're not saved. You're going to hell. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. That blessing is to a man that's saved is right with God. He thinks Bible. That's what he does. We got hats with that. If you want to think Bible hat, just come see me. I got one for you. He thinks Bible. He doesn't think the world's way. That man's blessing. Blessed is the man whose transgression is covered, whose sin is forgiven. That's Psalm 32. If your transgressions are covered and your sins are forgiven, you're blessed, you're saved. And look here. Blessed. Each one of these designates that God takes somebody who is the lowest of the earth and gives them the highest of heaven. And that's who we are. And let's not ever forget it. Raise your hand if you grew up, being honest now, you grew up poor. Good for you. Poor people that grew up poor, they don't throw stuff away. They'll save it. My Mima would set out whatever we had left over from supper the night before was lunch the next day. And I don't care if it was three bites of pinto beans in a bowl. She set that out and they were going to be eaten for lunch and that was it. Didn't throw it away. Broke things, you didn't throw them away. You tried to fix them, including marriages. God picks people like that. Because they know what life is really... Rich people don't understand life the way poor people do. Amen? They don't get it. They don't understand it. Poor pe But when you, were, when you were young and you were poor, did you know it? You didn't know you was poor. You was just growing up and it was just part of daily life. Now look at this. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor... In spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me ask you, how much riches is in the kingdom of heaven? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, does he not? Go, I go to prepare a place for you, a mansion's waiting for you. Do you not know that? The streets of heaven are paved with pure gold, so pure that they are crystal clear. You can see through the gold. That's how pure that is. And gold is nothing more than pavement in heaven. The buildings are made of gold. The streets are made of gold. Everything's made of gold in heaven. And you are going to inherit that one of these days. God picked you not because you were rich. Not because your family was with the in families in town. Not because you were politically connected or motivated. God picked you because you were poor. Poor in spirit. That means you came to God totally bankrupt. You realize that when God called you, you had nothing with which to offer Him as payment for your salvation, which is exactly how God wanted you. God wouldn't take your money to begin with. He already owns it. He doesn't need it. He did not choose you because you were the best. He chose you because you were the worst. Blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at the next one. Blessed are they that mourn, for they should be comforted. How many mourning people do we have in this church this morning? My dad died in September. It must have been on my mind. It's been seven years and I'm missing. And I'm not going to get him back down here. We got a lot of widows in this church. And we love every one of them. By the way, 
Linda Carmichael, I don't know if she's listening or not, so Linda, do this. She's got work that needs to be done at her house. She's going to do the, the uh, chili cook-off this year. And I asked her, I said, if you've got grass to mow, leaves to rake, wood to cut, let us know. And she said, all of the above. So how about let's get some brotherhood and some sisters to help this widow. That's a big house for just her. Okay? And I don't know if she might she think about moving. I don't know. But let's help them out. We got widows in this church. And if, we, and if y'all need help, it should be us helping them. You better say amen to that. That's our responsibility. That's our job. Pure religion and undefiled is this, to help the widows and the fatherless. First thing he said. Okay? So, let's, if some widows in this church need something done around the house, let's get some guys out there and let's get it done. That is the weakest, worst amen I've heard in a long time. I'm dead serious. We have to take care of these ladies. I promised their husbands that we would take care of them. Don't let them down. Amen? Amen. If you're here this morning and you're mourning, you're favored by God. You're favored by God. He actually said, that's what James said, the real religion, pure religion, is to help the widows and the fatherless and to be unspotted from the world. If you are here and you are mourning this morning, you are favored by God. Ladies, you're not ever alone. You're not ever alone. The Holy Ghost has been in your house ever since your husband died. He's been there When you went home and you were all alone and you let it all out, Jesus was there with you. Amen, God's people? Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek is not a weakness. To be meek takes a strength that most people don't have. Let me explain to you what meekness is. Meekness is when the guy behind you is sick of being behind you and he finally passes you and he passes you with his middle finger sticking out his window so you plainly see that he hates your guts. That happened to me Friday. I, was, I, was, I won't tell you how fast I was doing down 55, but I was going way over the speed limit, and this guy behind me was not happy. And he went around me, and he sailed his finger out the window for about five minutes to know, so that I know that he's meaning me. And I said to my wife, I said, is that supposed to mean something? You know, I didn't flip it back. I didn't honk at him. I didn't try to speed up to him to make him mad. That's road rage, by the way. You'll get arrested for that stuff. Being meek means that you, listen to me, you'll let others grab and run first, and you'll let them get cut in line first, and you'll let them get before you get and not say anything. Meekness was when Abraham had given Lot all that he had, And Lot's herdsmen began to strive with Abraham's herdsmen. And Lot, him and Lot got together. And Abraham said, Lot, you just take whatever you want. You go that way and I'll go the opposite way. Abraham did not have to do that. He could have told Lot, I don't care what you do, but get your stuff out of way from me. This is, it was mine first. But he didn't do that. He kept his mouth shut. And Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. And Lot lost everything that he had. And Abraham got northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Abraham inherited the entire earth while Lot lost everything. Meekness 
is letting greedy people be greedy and you not say nothing about it. Meekness is letting people gossip about you and tear you down and while you keep your mouth shut and just pray for them. Meekness is seeing something on Facebook that makes you mad and boy, you want to dive right into it and meekness says, nope, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let stupid people talk like they're stupid. Answer not a fool according to their folly, lest thou be also like unto them. That is meekness. God did not choose the big mouths. God did not choose the trash talkers. God did not choose all of that crowd that makes speeches and everything like that. God chose the meek. The people who let other people run over them. The people who will take it on the other cheek. The people who will go the extra mile. The people who will, when their coat is taken, will give their cloak also. God chooses those people. Because after all, Jesus, the King of Kings, let them nail him to a cross and he never said a word. Except, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. If that's you, God's favor is on you. Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know what that, I mean, mean, look at these blessings here. They are for people who are down here, poor in spirit, mourning, meek people. The people who hunger and thirst are the people who are hungry and thirsty. They have nothing. When you will have riches in this life, you will not hunger and thirst after righteousness. You will hunger and thirst for more money because you like what the money provides for your flesh and the thrills of your flesh. Do we not understand that the richest people in the world are the most immoral people in the world? They are adulterers, they are drunkards, they are dope heads, they are, they are sex fiends, they are everything. And God rejects them. So you have your money, you have your status, you're going to burn with it one of these days. And God's going to look over you and find somebody down here that's downtrodden and have nothing. I found out that I can go to the poorest neighborhood in Kenya and preach the gospel, preach about hell, fire, and condemnation, and three people get saved. Do you know why? They have nothing else. They have nothing. They have not, they don't have a house to live in. They don't have money. They don't barely have food. They have no clean water. They defecate wherever they stand. They have nothing. And God will accept them over the people with money. Every time. God found you hungry. And God found you thirsty. And God filled you. That's Gideon. That's us. Look at verse 7. Blessed are the merciful. They shall obtain mercy. You know what that means? Somebody, somebody harmed you. Somebody harmed you. And you forgave them. drunk driver crashed into your daughter or your son or your wife or your husband or your mom or your dad and killed them instantly and they lived and you forgave them. Somebody stole all your money and you forgave them. I'm battling that right now. God's dealing with me right now about unforgiveness. Somebody molested you and you forgave them. Blessed are the merciful. Merciful goes along with meekness, doesn't it? Somebody did something wrong to you or to somebody you know. 
and you forgave them. There are not many people in this world like that anymore. But that's the people that God chooses. Not the unforgiving. Do, let me ask you a question. Us, us here in this church, knowing us here in this church, do we want a church full of forgiving people or unmerciful people in this church? Do you want a pastor who is unmerciful or merciful? I want a congregation that's merciful. That'll forgive. Those are, we, we don't see these qualities as being great qualities in the rich and successful of this world. But that's, who, that's the people that God calls. That's the people that God blesses. That's Gideon. Gideon didn't have anything else. And he's out threshing wheat in the darkness just to not be caught so him and his family have something to eat. Okay? And God called that man. And God will call you. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The crowd that goes to church... Because the pastor told them that God makes them rich and wealthy and healthy and, and cures all their diseases. They're not pure in heart because they have an ulterior motive for worshiping God. They've been told that if they say the words right and do the practices right and the rituals right, then God has to return some sort of benefit or favor to them. That's not pure in heart. When you ask yourself, why do I come to church? Why do I sing? Why do I give testimony? Why do I love the people here in this church when you start ask, when you start realizing that you're not here to get you're here because you have already gotten and you you got what you didn't deserve i mean you got heaven right you got out of hell you got forgiveness by God. You didn't deserve that. God did not pick you when you were the best. God chose you when you were the worst. That's when he came to you. So, uh, blessed are the pure in heart. Your motives then, your motives for giving and offering. If I told you, now the more you give, the more God will bless you. So, I mean, pile it in there now. I mean, if you want to be rich, I mean, you just pile it in there. God will make you rich. God accounts how much you got in there. And I've even heard, I've even heard these rascals say that when you give an offering, you're loaning money to God. And God has to pay you back with interest. You know what the Bible says about that? The borrower is servant to the lender. That makes God your slave. That makes me angry. Makes me unmerciful when I think about it. What are your motives for wanting your family right with God, yourself right with God? What is your motives for wanting to serve in the church? Is it to be noticed? Is it to climb the ladder? Or is it just you just do it because that's where your heart is? That's your, that's your right motives. God chooses the people. He didn't say pure in body, did He? The biggest harlot can be the most pure in heart. Amen? That's Bible. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You're a peacemaker when you don't try to incite a riot on Facebook. And God deals with me about that all the time. All the folks watching me, if you messaged me on Facebook in the last year and wondered why I haven't responded, I am almost never on Facebook personally. There's a reason why. When I get on there and I see somebody picking apart something that ain't right, I want to get in on it. And usually I want to say how stupid they are And that's just not good for me. So I'd rather be a peacemaker. I'd rather 
when I see two people in this church not getting along with each other, I want to see them getting along with each other. When I see a husband and wife not getting along, I want them to get along with each other. That's my nature. I watched this church split 1979. Worst thing I ever saw in my life. And I thought, I don't want that ever again. So, a peacemaker is somebody who's not starting the trouble. They're trying to end it. Amen? You're a peacemaker, by the way, when you see somebody who is lost and you know that they're enmity with God and you witness to them and they get saved, you are a peacemaker between them and God. You've just ended the war between them and God. That's what makes you a peacemaker. God, God picks people like you. Then, verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So, What's going to happen when it all turns bad and they want to come start taking our Bibles away and they want to start taking our kids away for us teaching them the gospel and they want to start taking me away for preaching against sodomites and all this and that and the other. What's going to happen when we really start getting persecuted? We're going to pull out our guns and shoot them dead and... I, somebody asked me that question, how, how, what are you going to do on the day when it all turns bad? And I said, I don't know. And I won't know until it happens. Because yeah, I like my liberties, I like my Second Amendment, I like my Bible and my guns and all that stuff. I'm in favor of all that stuff. But I know that there's coming a day when God's not going to call us to fight, He's going to call us to stand and be persecuted. And God is not necessarily in the favor of the hotheads who are ready to pull the trigger at a moment's notice. Like some of us are. Did I say that right? Did I say it right? Did I say that some of us were hotheads that were ready to pull the trigger? I'm right in that, right? You bet I am. But there's a greater blessing in being persecuted. Let God help you on the day when it's your day to be persecuted. Those are the people that God picks. God picked Gideon because he had been run out and chased out of every scene that he would have been in and he was there by himself, the lowest in his family, of the poorest family, and God knew that he had never lifted a spear against anybody. God didn't call him to lift a spear. God called him to shine a light. And there's a difference. So it's not the hot-headed, loud-mouthed politicians. It's not the famous people of the world, the rich people of the world. That's not who God's picking. God's picking the meek ones. The ones who've been run over. The ones who've been abused and hurt. The ones who've been kicked out of one group after another, unfriended dozens of times on Facebook. I'm just going to unfriend them and block them. Trust me, they did you a favor. Okay? That's who God picks. That's his mighty people. Okay? Keep that in mind. Maybe, maybe you're not so much a Gideon today, but it might help you to think in that direction. The greatest battle ever fought in the Bible was never fought by men. Battle is not yours. It's God's. So think about the blessings of being the lowest people. Think about that. Let's bow our heads for prayer.